England, former Deputy Secretary of Defense and former Secretary of the Navy. Uh, it was my pleasure to work with him multiple times in the Pentagon to see this man's leadership, to see his understanding of the government, of the industry, and of the missions of the Department of Defense. And I can truly say I, I, uh, I learned a great deal from him. And there was moments in time where I, I admired his patience, of course his wisdom, uh, but he really could get through an issue to an issue as fast as anyone I've ever seen and state it in the most common sense terms and frankly motivate decisions that were very hard to take sometimes when we talk about resources and missions. He is the perfect gentleman, the perfect professional, the perfect person to be here today to moderate a conversation and I'll allow him to make introductions of the panel he has. And we are really fortunate and pleased to have with us uh, Honorable Gordon England and the panel. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome them. So it is uh, terrific, uh, terrific to be with you today. Hopefully this will be an interesting conversation <clears throat> during what are some very interesting times, and I think challenging times for the military, the government, and for industry. So I am fortunate to have a couple of my friends and industry leaders here, Ellen Lorth, CEO of Textron, and Jerry DeMuro, CEO of uh, BAE, right? I had to think twice because Jerry and I were in General <laughs> Dynamics <coughs> uh, together, and then Jerry went on way beyond where I did in General Dynamics, became CEO of BAE. And uh, what's really delightful to have Ellen and Jerry here is that their defense companies are defense companies, but they also have a commercial side, and that's very unusual. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, but first, uh, I'm going to set the stage. And I'm going to set the stage by uh, commenting that, in my view, there are three strategic changes, important strategic issues in the world today. And those three strategic issues in the world is that first, China, for really the first time, if you go back historically, China now has interests beyond their traditional borders. So you actually see them now moving beyond their traditional borders. And that raises some concerns, I think, uh, U.S. government and also uh, with the U.S. military. Russia more so reasserting herself, so reclaiming some lost leadership, prestige that they had in the world when it was the Soviet Union, so reasserting itself. And then the third is Iran developing nuclear weapons, and that, of course, may be the most profound uh, of all is Iran and, and the quest for nuclear weapons. Now, in addition, <clears throat> there are some what I view tactical issues going on. I hope they're tactical and not strategic. One is the Sunni-Shia, the split continuing to widen between Sunnis and Shias, and that has led to Al-Qaeda, has led to ISIS, and sowing the seeds for more terrorism around the world. And then, of course, there's national things going on. I mean, uh, <clears throat> Europe, the EU, struggling mightily. They have a lot of debt, and they have low birth rates, sinking economies, struggling economies, certainly, and a lot of conflicts over immigration. Of course, we have our own challenges in this country, but if you listen to DOD, one way to deal with all this is to sort of break the trend line and to have more and more innovation, and particularly disruptive innovation. So first question I'd like to ask, uh, and Ellen, I guess I'll ask you first. I mean, if just you know, I could hand you $100 million, $200 million, but a significant sum of money. If I could give you $100 million to Textron, said, here's IR&D money, where would you invest that money? I mean, what would you, where would you put that money to give the U.S. a significant edge in our military capability? Great question, Gordon. I'll answer from the perspective of Textron Systems, the portion that I have. I would put it in unmanned systems. Right now, I think there's enormous capability out there, but we could have even more. With the miniaturization of electronics, with a lot of the technology we have, I believe some of the tactical unmanned aircraft systems can begin doing some of the mission sets that the strategic um, unmanned aircraft systems have. 
I believe we have more to do with unmanned surface vessels, and I believe the communications between the two can be very, very significant. Perhaps we could even have an aerial layer that could replace some of the satellites out there. So part of my premise here is that we have a huge installed base. With the very constrained funds we have these days, and we will always have, I think we need to look at what we have deployed right now what we can make incremental investments in and really get some step function changes in capability. So I would take what we have out there in terms of unmanned systems and really beef that up a little bit. So Jerry, I mean, your headquarters is in the UK, right? I mean, right. you're in the US part of the UK, so same thing. UK says, well, great emphasis on innovation, so here's 100 million bucks. What would you do, Jerry? How would you invest it? Well, we're where you invest depends on your portfolio. And from our perspective, uh, we operate across a full spectrum from the, the really sexy, uh, high-tech things that, that assist in anti-access area denial technologies, uh, long-range strike, but also uh, we're very active in directed energy weapon systems. And so through those three, uh, we would look for a combination of things that are very relevant to uh, the mission, not only in the near term, but looking at mid and long term uh, for some sort of sustained advantage and a market opportunity. But there's also the, the opportunity given our portfolio to invest in those things that are less sexy but very, very necessary to keep the fleet operating. We're one of the largest providers, as I mentioned to you earlier, of uh, repair services for the surface fleet. And uh, we are actually investing in infrastructure to support uh, the additional volume that's going to be coming into the Pacific Fleet and being able to handle operation and maintenance. So there's a low end, high end mix uh, that provides an opportunity. But on the technology side specifically, it would probably be in those other three areas where we do quite a bit of work. So let me ask you this. Back in the 80s, I, I wrote an article back when I was director of avionics after I'd been in defense business for a while. And I said, the defense industry is an economic system within the larger U.S. economic system. So if you think about the U.S. defense establishment, I always view it as here's this economic system surrounded by walls, and it sits in the middle of the U.S. economic system. And those walls are rules and regulations set up by the Congress and the U.S. government, DOD, et cetera. And those walls, they bracket the companies that do business in defense. So my definition of a defense company is not, some, is not a company that, that builds defense equipment, it's someone who knows how to build defense equipment. So in the walls we have defense companies and outside the walls we have commercial companies. And nowadays a lot of the technology, unlike when I was in industry, now a lot of the technology is outside the wall and those companies actually don't want to come inside the wall. So, so tell me, you know, going forward, I mean, I mean, if you really want to be in it, if you want to be innovative going forward, I mean, sort of what do you think the model is? I mean, here's innovative commercial companies outside the wall, here's defense companies with limited funds. By the way, here's a data point. If you take the top 20 uh, IR&D companies in the world, None of them are U.S. defense companies. As a matter of fact, if you take the, f the top five defense companies and you put all their IR&D together, they're still not in the top 20. So, you know, money does make a difference when it comes to innovation. So, I mean, you're both in commercial and defense. So how do you see this going forward? Yeah, I, think, I think basically we have to use more commercial practices. So <laughs> what do I mean by that? In commercial businesses, you look at your market, you see what the gaps are, you predict what the market needs, and you build that. Typically, in the defense world, you've been paid to develop and then um, commercialize something. I believe that what we need to do is make smart bets and invest on our own, as the DOD's been asking us to do that, and be out there and fly before you buy or go downrange and show how something can be used. But we can only effectively do that 
if we have the ability to communicate with our DOD customers. And that's one of my biggest, biggest concerns now. I think in this environment with so many protests and everybody being very nervous, we're seeing a situation where we no longer have the level of dialogue that industry needs. I need to understand where I put my discretionary money. I don't want to build things that no one needs. However, I need to talk to the users, I need to talk to the acquisition community about what those mission capability gaps are. And I mean, that's why we're all here. We're having a forum where we could exchange ideas. I think we need more of this and it concerns me um, that we have PEOs that no longer feel comfortable having meetings with industry and so forth. We need to invest on our own to be able to do things. We also need on the government side to make it easier to do business. We need to speed things up. We need to simplify it. We have oversight on top of oversight on top of oversight that is putting so much cost into the system that small companies just cannot afford to play. They're opting out. Even big companies are doing the same thing, going over to the commercial side. So I think we have to make it easier and we have to take companies that know how to do business and have them more readily partner with the small companies. And the small companies have to lean forward and reach out to the big companies. That's my perspective. Uh, I certainly agree with all that without uh, repeating it. I, I, Gordon, you, you mentioned something a, a little bit earlier uh, that uh, may be worth repeating to the audience, which I think is germane to this issue. You know, within the defense industry, uh, we operate in, in a broad ecosystem, right? And uh, it starts with legislation out of Congress, regulation from the agencies, the requirements development process, we talked about the JROC process, the acquisition systems, the oversight. So it's, it's a broad ecosystem, but uh, you talked about uh, layer upon layer. You mentioned a statistic earlier that I think would be uh, of interest to this group. See, I, I comment, they were talking about layers of management, of course, in all commercial companies, you're trying to make everything as flat as you can. Department of Defense, when I was there, I asked them to look at the number of layers in the Department of Defense, and there were 27 layers. <laughs> I mean, you will see no company with 27 layers. So we had 27 layers between the Secretary of Defense to basically the lowest level in the Department of Defense. That's a lot of layers. It's a lot of overhead, by the way. I think we were comparing notes earlier as well. We've seen revenues come down in a lot of areas, yet if we look at the amount of auditors, the number of auditors we have in our plants, it's two and three times what it used to be. And it takes our time and effort to house those people, help them get the information they need. That's time taken away from innovation. It's just like this whole issue of slowing down the procurement process when it goes on three, six, nine, 12 months, we are having teams of people waiting to respond to questions and things versus being in the lab or being outside, actually innovating and bringing new capabilities. So Gordon, just uh, going back to, to your question, um, I think that industry has demonstrated that it can be very agile. Uh, to Ellen's point, uh, you know, we have uh, organizations which we spoke about where we have one third of the revenues, half the employees, and now three times the number of auditors uh, resident in the facility. And at the same time, we have audits uh, for overhead rates for the year 2005, 2006 that aren't completed yet. And you end up in litigation because there's no other way that the ACO can get it resolved because of statute of limitations. So things um, are, are a bit out of balance in that regard. Uh, and, and I would suggest that it would be difficult to find someone who would point to these added layers, the legendary number of signatures you need for a material release or JROC uh, that is improving the affordability, the quality of these products, and certainly the time to get them delivered uh, to the soldier, right? And so these other activities cost money. We're using human capital, which costs money. We're spending R&D and BNP dollars that, that are not going to developing the next directed energy weapon that are not going to developing the next whiz-bang application of maybe a commercial technology being incorporated. And so you talk about this huge difference in what private sector investment is by comparison with the Department of Defense. Let's not also forget, or let's not forget that 
this is a very, very highly regulated industry, uh, including how your business systems will operate, what profit you can or cannot make, and coming back and reviewing that three, three years later. I would tell you that Google doesn't have that restriction. When it decides that it sees an available market, and those markets are larger than defense, it can use returns, uh, iPhone returns for whatever, you know, if, if you're Apple, uh, those profits are unlimited, and that turns back into investment and innovation. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there's a complex set of issues operating here. Intellectual property is another one. Look at what happens in, in Ellen's scenario. We'll, we'll bring, uh, we talked about the JTRS program. Many of the companies here have participated since we're talking about C4I in the JTRS program. And there's been one version, one type, uh, canceled after another, another procurement, bring a 70% solution. Over three years, you develop that solution in partnership, spend tens and tens of millions of dollars. You're using human capital that can't be used anywhere else. Come to market and it gets canceled. There's no place you can take that technology, and that's money that can't be <coughs> recaptured and, and, and purposed. And, and the uh, amount of money to be applied is limited because we're in a regulated industry by definition. So, I mean, here's, here's sort of the bottom line of this, though. I mean, put my hat on when I was deputy secretary because of all the acquisition issues. Um, I had them look back to see all the studies reforming acquisition. Well, when I was on the Defense Science Board, I actually ran two or three myself, so I knew there were at least two or three studies. It turns out there were 128 different studies to improve the acquisition processes in the Department of Defense, and I had one more to go back and review all 128 to see if there were anything we should do. Now, the, the fact of the matter is, <clears throat> I don't think it's going to get better. I mean, it'd be nice to say it is, but it is a regulated industry, and in fact, the DOD is a child of the Congress. So when Secretary Rumsfeld, when he was uh, Secretary of Defense, <clears throat> we were talking about this, and he told me when he was Secretary of Defense the first time, and a <clears throat> appropriations authorization bill would come over from the Congress, it would come over and it would be maybe six, eight, ten pages. All eight years I was there, when the bill would come from Congress, it would be like 12, 13, 1400 pages. Now I've been gone five or six years, but I expect it's about the same. So, you know, I'm not sure it's going to get better. I mean, that's just the way, I mean, and by the way, it's not a criticism. It's our form of government, right? I mean, it's the way we are set up. So, so the, the problem and the question really is, how is it that we can be innovative? I mean, I know we have a one-year budget cycle before we even decide what the money is, and the Congress decides, and they debate it, and that's another nine months, and then we put out proposals, and then there's response, and then, like you say, there's typically protests nowadays. So in the commercial world, their cycle's about six months, and we're a couple years before we even get started on the program. But that's the reality, and, and so somehow, how do we deal with this? I mean, it is a real issue in my mind going forward, and, and I don't believe the commercial companies are gonna jump into this walled in environment because it hurts their commercial business. And so we're sort of, have what we have, right? And so, I mean, Ellen and, and Jerry, you both said it. I mean, I, I think somehow we have to find out how is it we can, we can't get companies to jump the wall, but we have to find a way to get the technology to jump the wall. And, and you're in that business mm -hmm. of both commercial yep. and defense. And I, I, I don't know, I challenge this. is something you need to think about. How is it that we reach out and get that technology and bring it into our defense products. I'll take that one first. I, I, I think it starts with what Ellen said. It's clarity of requirements. Um, organizations such as FCA provide an ethical forum to have those kinds of exchanges. We understand the, the, uh, the pressures that PMs and requirements organizations feel today in, in, in this environment, but 
having that dialogue, understanding it. I think it was Bob Work that talked yesterday about his uh, third offset strategy. It's, there's no uh, mystery. We've, we've had some uncertainty in this market space for quite a number of years. You know, you can go back to 2011, and it was a specter of sequestration before we had sequestration. Then we had sequestration. Then we had relief under um, the Murray Ryan bill. Now we're back in this period of uncertainty. We've got the, the, uh, the DOD coming in and disregarding sequestration and, and the caps and saying, these are my bona fide needs, you gotta meet them, with a defined strategy. So with clear communication, the defined strategy around this third offset that said we're gonna look at technology in three buckets. I'm oversimplifying, I'm sure, but uh, we're gonna look at the near term. What do we need with those platforms? How can we enhance lethality, you know, survivability, our ability to uh, see the enemy and, and react before they can? Then the midterm and the long term. That provides great clarity to us in these mission areas and an open dialogue about that. So a defined strategy, a clear budget picture, Taxes wouldn't hurt either if we could solve that one, <laughs> you know, in terms of a, a, a business environment. And uh, Ellen alluded to it earlier, uh, and, and you mentioned it, uh, you know, we, we have a, almost a billion dollar portfolio uh, in commercial aerospace with Boeing, GE engines, Airbus. Uh, it, and so all of these companies have these agile practices and what we're doing in places like the railgun, we're using commercial technology in electromagnetics and battery storage to propel something without you know, explosive force uh, with enough energy that it, that it leaves the muzzle at Mach 7. So we can leverage that in, in commercial imagery. We're using in our uh, geo-exploitation tool sets uh, that are used by the intel agencies. We're using commercially available uh, software, packaging that in there. So I think industry does know how to, to use this osmosis to bring technology back and forth and people going in both directions. And when we have clear direction and uh, consistency, I think you know, we will be able to leverage commercial technology. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think it comes down to simplicity, speed, and communication. So let's talk about what a capability is that's required and not have requirements you know, that are this high in terms of pieces of paper. So let's be much clearer about what capability is desired, and then let's simplify the process of industry understanding what that is by not just having an industry day and maybe seeing people at one or two trade shows. If we could come up with a system more like what's used in the commercial world where we get together between customers and suppliers and talk more. I think there's a lot that could be done in terms of setting up forums to explain to industry multiple times a year from different PEOs what's required. And let's keep talking about it back and forth and get it done. Now, part of the simplification in the contracting process would come about if we would do more commercial of a type type contracting. And right now, the barriers are so high to overcome to demonstrate that a widget is this exact same widget, no changes that was on a price list before. We are driving incredible amounts of cost through that contracting process where I think we could simplify it and sell in a more commercial way. And if you did that, then you would see companies that don't want to do defense business right now invest more of their money in new innovations because they know they could sell it and they're not going to go through months of IP negotiations and that type of thing in terms of the government has to have rights and so forth. Good. One of the challenges I think so, we have a so let me ask you this. I mean, at the heart of all this, of course, is money, right? You can't do anything without money, and we've had this issue in sequestration. We still don't know how much money DOD is going to have. And uh, the last time we had a drawdown, by the way, I was with General Dynamics. I was running the Fort Worth Company of General Dynamics, 1991. When I came in as a company president in 1991, we had 26,500 people building F-16 airplanes. When I left four years later, we had 11,500. So 15,000 people out of 26,000 left during that downturn. And, uh, and I know, I'm gonna ask you, you, you know, it's heard by how many people have come down in that time period in industry. I know it's a lot. 
Now, I only comment because in the Department of Defense, when uh, Secretary Leon Panetta became Secretary of Defense, it had not been long since I'd been out of office, so I wrote a op-ed. It was either New York Times or uh, Wall Street Journal, I'm not sure, but there was an op-ed. And in the op-ed, I said, Mr. Secretary, if I was in your position, here's the five things I would do in terms of effectiveness and efficiency in the Department of Defense. And, and the number one on the list was, I would reduce the civilian workforce by at least 100,000 people. And now I will tell you what's happened in the meantime. The last I heard, it had grown by about another 40,000 people. So the overhead's gotten more as the budget's gone down or is pretty much flat. <coughs> Uh, and in addition, when I was in the building, the medical bill was like $20 billion a year. Now I think it's about $60 billion a year. So that's money that's not going on investment. And in addition, uh, salaries and benefits since 2001 have gone up like 80%. So the amount of money available is, is much, much less than DOD. So at least the impression I get is that industry is squeezing down but the department isn't, and, and I, I believe my recommendation to the Department of Defense would be show to Congress that you can be the most efficient organization, just like you're forcing companies to do, and you may do better in terms of arguing the sequestration. So anyway, a comment for you. I know well, that's, so, a, that's a tough political <laughs> problem. Uh, there are a lot of dynamics that, that constrain uh, DOD that, that keep it from operating as a rational enterprise, economic enterprise. Um, you know, part of it is political, um, and Certainly. some of it has to do with the administration. Some of it has to do with Congress itself, which will not give the department the latitude to do what we've done. We talk about, uh, I think the top, uh, I saw a study that said the top 10 DOD companies had given up well over 200,000 positions in the last uh, four or five years. BAE Systems is down uh, about 30%. The combat vehicle business is down to a third in terms of headcount, we went from 53 facilities down to 15 facilities. DOD can't get approval to use BRAC. It, it cannot get approval. We both have addressed across industry, all private sector, healthcare costs by getting employees to share more, by aggregating services, et cetera. They're not allowed to touch that. They're not allowed to touch end strength. They can't retire systems that they don't think are, are necessary anymore. So there are a number of constraints there that, that keep them from doing that. And even the civil service regulations um, make it very challenging for them to go in the other direction from, from a headcount point of view. I agree with all of that. There are a lot of efficiencies that we've all had to put in place over the last five years especially. So it's not just the last six or 12 months that we've been managing down facilities and managing down workforces and so forth. Um, one of the challenges I think we have is having the DOD embrace that themselves, and it's complex, as Jerry has said, so I won't get into all of that. One of the challenges, though, for industry in all of this is when we go through all of our audits, our cost reductions are not being taken into consideration as we go into next contracts, and that's a challenging thing for all of us when we Wait, What, do, what does that mean? So not we bring down our costs, and often, we do that on fixed price contracts sure. so that we boost our profit a little bit through investments in capital. For instance, right. we have some very complex welding and this might be something that drives your labor force to have injuries, so it's problematical all the way around. Um, in, we invest tens of millions of dollars in capital to make something more efficient, more predictable, and oh, by the way, like a commercial industry, <coughs> allows us to scale up and down in terms of volume very efficiently. So we don't increase in cost tremendously when we're making 10 a month versus 100 a month of different things. But what happens now in the way the DOD looks at this is if your cost base has gone down, then you, can, you can't take that on the next contract. All of a sudden, it's a zero-sum game. So one of the challenges in all of this is the thought process that there is no reward, if you will, for cost reductions. And that's problematical because it helps the partnership, the government-industrial partnership, if we're taking costs out and bringing costs down overall. But that's not being realized, and I think that goes back to the idea of how do we get more efficient within the DOD. 
So there needs to be more dialogue on that topic. So, so let me ask you this. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, maybe the most important thing is we get, just like the military, get the best people in the country, and it's all about people, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it's all about people, but it's true in the industry, it's all about people. Mm -hmm. So one time, everyone wanted to be in the defense industry. Like me, I mean, I got out of college, I went in the defense industry, spent my career there, and it was the leading edge of technology the whole time I was there. I had a blessed career because it was challenging my entire career. I have absolutely no regret. I was at the leading edge of technology the whole time. So now, and, and I spend time with various universities now, and when you talk to the students, they're all talking about, well, such and such went with Google or somebody is with Apple or somebody is with you know, Facebook or somebody new startup because they all get options and they make big salaries. So the, the impression I get is that top students now are looking at commercial companies because they view that as the f leading edge of technology. So I guess my question is, tell me about, you, tell me about your recruiting and your I uh, say yes and no on that one I mean, because you're we do not, great things. You're I mean, probably not hiring cool a lot, stuff. though, right? Um, oh, yeah. It, yeah. We hired about uh, 5,000 people last year. I would say two-thirds of those are uh, engineers of one sort or another, hardware, software. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's in certain areas. Um, we had some attrition in other areas that, that had to be balanced out. So net-net, we were not up. But... Uh, I'm with Ellen on that one. You know, we, we do some pretty interesting things. I mean, we're here uh, by the Port of San Diego. Think about the complexity of a submarine, the system. You've got, you got nuclear warheads, yeah. you have nuclear reactors, you have redundant systems. These people can, you know, and the only reason they have to come back is they've got to get food, right? Yeah. Think about really interesting things in, in combat vehicles, survivable solutions. Uh, it's just like STEM education. You have to get them early. What we do is we treat internships as three-month job interviews during the summer. So mm -hmm. we go out and we do a lot of recruiting on oh. college campuses mm -hmm. and get kids between freshman um, and sophomore year, sophomore and junior year. And if you craft it correctly, mm. you can give those kids experiences that they are not going to get at a lot of regular commercial companies. Yeah, I think we've gotten a lot more creative in industry uh, across the board, sharing these kinds of things, joint recruiting trips. You go down to Austin, University of Texas. Um, I, I don't think any of us are having a real problem. What we found in the last year, the you know, unintended consequence, this restriction on compensation. Kids pay attention. You talked about what, what they can get as a package in Google, et cetera, and they say, geez, earnings are limited here, you know, 200,000, whatever that, that number is. Over time, that's going to be impactful to us because they want to have, you know, the same opportunity that the kid next to them in class had. Yeah, no, Jerry, it's a really good point. And I think our HR people are getting incredibly creative, different ways of getting cash to people, different ways of getting experiences. But I think in this day and age, in this information age, kids want to move around quickly too. So you get them in, you give them something challenging to do, and then you move them quickly. It's like 12 to 18 months. It's not like all of us who probably yeah. spent a little bit more time Things, but well, that's good. That's encouraging. So look, we're going to have some questions, and while you're thinking of your questions, and maybe we get mics ready, and we'll, we'll open up the floor. Uh, <clears throat> there's one thing everyone in this room can do, though, because Ellen mentioned STEM, right? And um, that's not that's not the strong point in the United States. I mean, across STEM, right across all the technologies, United States is ranked. 26th, 26th in the world in STEM. <clears throat> and by the way, in engineering graduates, you take all the graduates in all the universities last year, year before, year before that, 5% of all of the students who graduate are engineers in the United States. In Europe, comparable in terms of size in the United States, it's 13%. In Asia, which is four times as many graduates, is 26%. So long term, if you're really looking at the competitiveness of the country, I mean, we're going to have to do something much better in terms of educating 
the young people, I mean, and that's true from literally K through 12 and at, the, and at the university level. So you might, whenever you get an opportunity, go help work that problem in your community. Okay, we're gonna open it up to questions. Do we? Um... Good afternoon. Oh, okay, oh good, okay, great, thank you. The first question is addressed to Ms. Lord by Dick Alburn, president of Synapse International. Question is, small businesses continue to be challenged in having their innovative technologies accepted by risk-averse program managers, both within DOD and our large primes. How can we get your managers and government program managers to embrace and manage the risk inherent in the incorporation of potentially game-changing technologies? Thank you, Dick. That's a very good question. I think that generally senior leadership at industry companies are very, very interested in innovation, and especially small companies that are thinking differently that aren't in the same constraints we are. So I would encourage small business owners to reach out to the top of companies. Uh, I just went through this yesterday. I was at the Army War College. Send me an email. Send all of us emails. We want those kinds of things Jerry is going Send to Send her know. an email. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, really, I think what happens is things get caught up in the middle. Um, people are busy every day. They're risk averse because a lot of times, um, particularly, I think this is an issue on the government side when we talk about government and industry, people are not being incentivized to lean forward and do something a little bit different. But, um, and they've got constraints in government. They have very narrow boundaries in terms of what their requirements documents say. In industry, I think that that's where we can embrace some of this. And I'd say, don't give up, keep trying, because I know I want to hear about that. I know a lot of people do. By the way, I was just going to make a comment. I do think that's hugely important because there's a lot of innovation in small companies. Absolutely. A lot of innovation Absolutely. because they can do it quick, uh, you know, get the people they want, they can provide incentives. And so. Anyway, I think that's a hugely important point. Yeah, and I think there's some organizations that help with that. So, for instance, we have one of our organizations in Massachusetts, and I'm on the Mass High Tech Council, and we put together, it's kind of like speed dating with big companies and small companies, so that you can spend three hours and move around and talk to people. I think, you know, they we have, have the, the ability. The, yeah, we have the same thing in, in uh, the Washington area and, and where our major locations are. I, I would just amplify what Ellen said and, and get at a level that understands the value proposition and where they are willing to advance that because of the benefit to the customer, right? And can be an advocate. You gotta find an advocate on the outside, you gotta find an advocate within the customer yeah. community that understands the value proposition. And oftentimes, small businesses are also limited because they don't have access at that level. Right. And that's where we as a large business can help uh, if we understand that value proposition to, yeah. to, to make the sale. And that's why we have some of these industry organizations, NDIA, others. That's the whole idea to get people together. So I'd say utilize some of those things. Okay, we have another question. We do. This question comes from Lieutenant General Bob Wood of AFSIA. Can you please point to what we may learn from the department's rapid acquisition efforts in recent years? And could we institutionalize or protect some aspects? I, I, we talked about this earlier, I, uh, I, I think absolutely it proves, and it doesn't matter whether it was the mobilization for World War II or the Vietnam era or Korea, uh, the system can adapt, we can implement common sense approaches without the 27 layers, maybe we could do without two. Uh, the complication of the acquisition process today, these RFPs that come out that require 30,000 different prices over a 10 year schedule that they're gonna look at in six different slices and alternatives to award. Um, if I go back, I'm an old acquisi former acquisition guy. You won't say old. Uh, and so if you go back and look 25 years ago, what was the relief rate for a protest at GAO? It was in the single digits, you know, single digit percentages. Relief rate, I saw a study that said back in 2009, I think, or 2010, it's now almost 50%. So these very complex acquisition strategies and evaluation models, I'm not sure what, that's, what that has really accomplished. We're not delivering equipment any faster. It's no less affordable. We're siphoning off precious resources to chase these things for two years. And we're coming up with 
acquisition structures, contracts. You know, one of the things you always get from your customer, even in IT infrastructure, help me save money, drive cost out. You talked about capital investments. We do that in our business systems so that we can do it more efficiently, less manpower. Uh, you see these contracts today that are one-year contracts. They're so one-sided so that the government has absolutely maximum leverage on every aspect. There's no fee. There's only award fee. Well, if you don't give me fee, how am I going to invest to save you money? It's a one-year contract with four one-year options. Well, we've got to make sure they're performing so that we can you know, motivate them to put their best people and keep them at it. Well, if you want me to make an investment in your business system, it may take me three years to recover that cost. If I only have a one-year contract, and it's award fee, and oh, by the way, it's the only fee I get, and we all know nobody starts above 80%, right? You can't do that. Forget about you know, the, the whole context. Where's the return that's going to let me invest? So the rapid uh, prototyping was a simplified, common sense approach, clear statement of requirements, delivery schedules, and we move forward. It can be done. I mean, the it bottom line is simplify, speed it up, communicate about what needs to be done. It really is the will inside the building to change it. There are so many layers, you know, uh, Frank Kendall, Bob Wark, they get it. You talk to them, they get it. You got it. How many layers between you and a program manager and a contracting officer that has to implement that? And now they have to answer to those 27 layers. You know, so w where's the incentive for them to do the right thing? Um, or take a risk. It can be done. I think the one-year money is a big issue too. Mm -hmm. If you're having to repropose every year and go through that, you barely get going. So multiple year contracts. I personally like fixed price contracts. Sure. I think it just simplifies things and if people are willing to step up and do it, let's do it. Not appropriate for everything. No, fixed some price of the very, very complicated developments, no, but we could do a lot more. I think. Absolutely. You know, we, we, we talked about the commercial <coughs> aviation business. I just reviewed a proposal this morning. It's a 10-year contract to an airframe manufacturer. Now, I'm making the investment up front. I'm going to sustain and guarantee him I'll protect against obsolescence, but I've got a 10-year contract. So I have a model that I can work with. And that gets back to the point I was making earlier. You make big investments, you lower your cost of doing business, but if, when you come up to the next year, all of a sudden that goodness all gets taken away and you start at the bottom, you can't recoup that. And so you start making choices about where you invest. Okay. We have time Question? for two or three more questions. Okay. The first one's coming from Everett Hayes of Hunt Huntington Ingalls Industries AMSEC. And the question is, what initiatives do you currently have in place to hire vets, and how will you increase those efforts in the future? That's a really good question. Um, it's interesting, I mentioned this mass high tech group um, that we work with quite a bit. They just actually put together um, a hire vets initiative um, using a bunch of software where we're going out and recruiting. I think all of us, in this day and age, put all of our jobs out on websites. They're out there. And frankly, we want vets because that's who we're serving. That's our customer. And we are very, very interested in that. So I'll tell you, any vet that applies to any of our jobs will be carefully, carefully considered. So I think it's, again, that communication gap. Um, I know that we are looking hard for that and trying to find many different ways. We're using all of those same tools, but we, and, and we're no different than any other company. We, we actually have specific uh, areas of responsibility within the HR function around the country that goes out in an outreach program. Besides all these automated tools and postings, it, that goes to a number of the association meetings, you know, sets up a booth, um, and also works to help vets prepare resumes, prepare for interviews, so that they can best display the skills and talents. The passion that the veterans have for the mission, we have great people in the industry, but that passion really sets them apart, and that's why they're, they're such an attractive uh, um, pool and resource to us. We also have a huge um, referral system that I find a lot of the vets we have have a lot of buddies that call them and apply, so that word of mouth is important. I was, uh, I was on the phone, I got a phone call from a good friend of mine, uh, retired uh, General Jimmy Williams, a lot of you know Jimmy, he was, he was on the way to a luncheon 
hiring vets. I mean, a big lunch and bringing in all the military. And look, there's no question. I mean, for across America, there's lots of people on this uh, campaign to hire vets because it makes so much sense. I mean, look, they're the most skilled, most dedicated, best workers you can hire. It's, I mean, it's just so beneficial for everybody to do that. Next one, you had two or three. Looks like we have time for one more question, sir. Okay. And it's addressed to Miss Lord from Stephanie Hutch of P3I Inc. Question is, traditionally the defense industry has been predominantly male. How do you view the expanding role of women in, in, in this industry? You know, I think it's a meritocracy. Um, I came out of the automotive industry for 11 years and then got into aerospace and defense. And people ask me all the time, you know, gee, how did you do that? Well, I sort of got up every morning and got dressed and put one foot in front of the other. And I worked hard at what I did. I think that there are a lot of women who are somehow a little tentative about aerospace and defense uh, because they don't understand it. And people are scared of what they don't understand. But 50% of the brains in the world are female. So let's get out there and you know get our fair share of those. So I think what we have to do is again come back to communication and let people know what's out there and really maybe actively um, reach out a little bit. Well, women, I mean, they run General Dynamics, they run Lockheed, they ran BAE before yeah. Jerry, and they run Textron. They seem to do it all very well. So it seems A piece of Textron. I just, Scott Donnelly is out. General Motors? Yeah. <laughs> Gordon, General so, Motors. Yeah, the yeah. Chair, right. so, chairman is yeah. a, a woman. I, I think that there is, frankly, a fear of the unknown. So I think everybody in this room can go out and try, you know, to pull a few more people in because that diversity of thought around the table mm. helps everybody. So uh, look, time has run out. How about a round of applause for my panel? Thank you very much, Ellen. Thank you, Greg. Well done. Appreciate and it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jerry. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please thank you. Uh, allow AFCA. And